condition. Her last menstrual period was March 26, 2021, with the previous menstrual period last January 24, 2021. She had an unremarkable review of systems. No known medical illness, no previous surgery. She does not have any allergy to food and medication. There's no history of diabetes mellitus, stroke, renal disease, or cancer in the family. She's a non-smoker, non-ethanol beverage drinker, and she denies illicit drug use. She had an unrecalled immunization history. She had her menarche at 10 years of age with irregular interval lasting for five days, using three pads per day without dysmenorrhea. Her coitarch was at 16 years of age with a total of two sexual partners. The last relationship was with an older American. She denied the use of any contraceptive method and no pap smear was done previously. So the patient denied the possibility of a pregnancy. She was seen awake, conscious, coherent, ambulatory, not in distress, with a BMI of 20.3. She was febrile at 38. Other vital signs were stable. Uh, she was not pale. Her abdomen was soft, with direct and rebound tenderness on the right lower quadrant. No rubbing sign, no soa sign, or no obturator sign. On pelvic examination, she had purulent and odorous vaginal discharge, no active bleeding, no polyps, no erosion. Her cervix is long, firm, and close with cervical motion tenderness. Uterus was not enlarged, no uterine tenderness with right and nexal fullness, no left and nexal mass fullness or tenderness palpated. So how do we approach a diagnosis for this patient? So given a reproductive age patient complaining of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, we should first rule out the possibility of pregnancy. So pregnancy test showed a positive result. Other laboratory tests done are the following. So um, she had leukocytosis of w with a WBC count of 18.2 with segmentor predominance, a normal urine analysis, an elevated CRP at 117.3, and an elevated beta HCG at 2,386.1 milliIE per ml. Vaginal discharge gram stain showed moderate gram positive bacilli with pus of 35 to 50 and epithelial cells of 5 to 10. A transvaginal ultrasound showed a normal-sized antiverted uterus with a thickened endometrium of 17 millimeters with an adexal mass on the right measuring 4 by 2 by 3 centimeters. So what should be our admitting impression? So first, we have confirmed that the patient is actually pregnant with a history of delayed menses, a positive pregnancy test, and an elevated serum beta HCG of 2386.1. We have an empty intrauterine cavity in our transvaginal ultrasound and an adexal mass measuring 4 by 2 by 3 centimeters. So now we're thinking of an ectopic pregnancy. Why? Because we know that with a serum beta HCG of at least 1,000 milliIE per ml, we should be able to see a gestational sac that's already compatible with a five-week sonologic age. However, if we look at the patient's pertinent signs and symptoms, there was purulent and odorous vaginal discharge. Um, she was febrile at 38 degrees. She has leukocytosis and elevated CRP. Her vaginal discharge also had pus of about 35 to 50 per oil immersion. So um, given these pertinent signs and symptoms, we can see that she actually meets the criteria um, seen in this um, image, which was lifted from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, showing guidelines for diagnosis of acute pelvic inflammatory disease. So which ones are present in the current patient? She had lower abdominal tenderness, adnexal tenderness, cervical motion tenderness. Um, her temperature was at 38 degrees with abnormal um, vaginal discharge. There was presence of abundant WBC on microscopy, and she had elevated um, C-reactive protein. 
So our working impression would be a gravita 1 para 0 ectopic pregnancy right, 7 weeks and 5 days age of gestation to consider pelvic inflammatory disease. So just a quick review, ectopic pregnancy occurs when the fertilized ovum or the developing um, blastocyst implants at the site outside of the endometrial cavity. And the most common would be a tubal pregnancy. And the most common part would be ampullary, accounting for 70% of cases. So suspicion of ectopic pregnancy is highly considered when a patient presents with a positive pregnancy test in the clinical triad seen in 45% of cases that includes vaginal spotting or bleeding, pain, and presence of a nexal mass. So what are the factors contributing to um, the risk of ectopic pregnancy? In majority of cases, it would be salpingitis. In 40% of cases, it's presumed that um, there's a physiologic disorder that results in a delay of passage of the embryo into the uterine cavity. Hormonal imbalance is also said to contribute to it, wherein elevated levels of estrogen or progesterone can alter normal tubal contact. Ductility. And cigarette smoking has been, has been um, said to be a risk, um, wherein the risk is directly related to the number of cigarettes smoked per day. Okay, so um, when there is a tubal pathology, there is disruption of the um, normal tubal anatomy as seen in infection, in previous surgery, and inflammatory disease, preventing the normal transport of the marula. So this table just summarizes the odds ratio for ectopic pregnancy and the attributable risk associated with different risk factors. And in our present patient, it's the probable salpingitis that might have put her at risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. This is a schematic diagram on how we go about the management of ectopic pregnancy. In the present case, the symptomatology and imaging are pretty straightforward, and the next step would be to treat the ectopic gestation. However, it would be different if the imaging is not diagnostic, and we would need a serum beta a serial serum beta HCG. So if the um, serum beta HCG is less than the discriminatory zone, it must be repeated after 48 hours, at which time we expect a doubling of the serum beta HCG in a normal pregnancy. So how to manage an ectopic pregnancy? It's usually a question of um, surgical or medical management. So just a review, methotrexate is the primary medical treatment for women who do not have any contraindications to its use. So this is a possible algorithm for use of methotrexate versus surgery for ectopic pregnancy lifted from comprehensive gynecology. So for the current patient, um, this, um, we did not see any gestational sac. However, under the relative contraindications to methotrexate use, the patient's ectopic mass is more than 3.5 to 4 centimeters as listed by ACOG in the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Hence, use of methotrexate isn't ideal in the present patient. But to review, there are two main protocols for methotrexate. So it can be given as a single dose or as a multi-dose. So if it's given as a single dose, uh, the computation would be 50 milligrams per meter squared uh, body surface area. And we should obtain a serum beta HCG at day one, four, and seven. If serum beta HCG levels do not decline by 15% from day four to day seven, um, there's an indication for additional dose. And then for multi-dose, up to four doses of both methotrexate and leucoverin until serum beta HCG declines by 15%. And the serum beta HCG is uh, repeated at day three, five, and seven. So laparoscopy is the procedure of choice for ruptured ectopic pregnancy and for cases when medical therapy is contraindicated or refused by the patient. So there has been a controversy whether salpingotomy, salpingostomy, or salpingectomy is better in the, cervical, in the surgical management of ectopic pregnancy as there is still a lack of randomized controlled trials. 
So salpingostomy is associated with increased rate of retained trophoblastic tissue. However, when they checked the subsequent intrauterine pregnancy in patients who underwent salpingostomy, they found out that 60% of cases actually had an intrauterine pregnancy and 15% had a subsequent ectopic pregnancy as compared to those who underwent salpingectomy where only 38% had an intrauterine pregnancy and 10% had a subsequent ectopic pregnancy. Salpingotomy has the worst subsequent pregnancy rates. So the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists suggests that we offer salpingectomy for an ectopic pregnancy and to consider salpingotomy as an alternative for women with risk factors for infertility where um, the contralateral tubes are damaged. The Philippine Obstetrical and Gynecological Society um, suggests that salpingectomy be offered for women with ruptured tube, uncontrolled tubal bleeding, and moderately or severely damaged tube. Salpingostomy is recommended for women with an unruptured tubal pregnancy, especially for those desirous of future pregnancy. So it is important to discuss the risk and benefits of each option and to obtain a re written informed consent prior to the operation. As for the current patient, um, salpingectomy is the treatment of choice. Remember that the present case is presumably also affected by uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, making the fallopian tube already deceased or damaged. And uh, the risk of ectopic pregnancy would be high in this case. Okay, so again, remember that the present case is um, affected by pelvic inflammatory disease. So as a review, um, it is an infection of the upper genital tract. According to comprehensive gynecology, it's not associated with pregnancy or intraperitoneal pelvic operations. And it is also refer referred to as salpingitis or infection of, of the OP ducts, as this is the most characteristic and common component of PID. So you may be wondering if PID is not associated with pregnancy, and how is it that we diagnose the present patient as to having both ectopic pregnancy and PID? So in some reports, they say that pregnancy and PID are rare to occur simultaneously. Pregnancy confers some form of barrier preventing the ascent of bacteria into the upper genital tract. Um, but this barrier is not yet well formed prior to 12 weeks. So they hypothesize that coexistence is still possible. So previously, the diagnosis of PID during pregnancy were only made intraoperatively. So it is important to note that they can coexist so we can initiate proper treatment. Pelvic inflammatory disease um, is a polymicrobial infection caused by organisms ascending from the vagina and cervix into the endometrium and to the mucosa of the OB duct. So in most cases, there's no causative organism found, but the two classic sexually transmitted organisms associated with PID are angonuria and C. trachomatis. Gonorrheal PID is said to be more severe in terms of presentation. Some other etiologic agents include mycoplasma genitalium, peptostreptococcus, bacteroides, and urea plasma. So the risk factors would include multiple sexual partners and the lack of contraceptive use. Okay. So how is the diagnosis of PID made? So by direct visualization. So laparoscopy is actually the most accurate method. Ultrasonography would have a limited value, but it is still helpful in documenting an adnexal mass. Clinical signs and symptoms are nonspecific. There's high false positive and false negative rates, but it is readily acceptable by most so that we can um, treat and avoid the long-term sequelae of the disease. So this is the same with the current patient. Just by the clinical signs and symptoms, it is important to, um, to treat the concomitant pelvic inflammatory disease. So what are the key issues in the treatment of PID? So you have to determine the need for hospitalization, careful follow-up, patient education, and treatment of sexual partners. So this is um, 
an image um, showing the indications for hospitalizing patients with acute pelvic inflammatory disease, such as those with surgical emergencies, a pregnant patient, or the patient is not responding to oral antibiotic therapy, or is unable to follow up or tolerate the outpatient oral regimen or if the patient has severe illness, nausea and vomiting, or high fever, or presence of tubo ovarian abscess. So for the current patient, obviously hospitalization is warranted because aside from the PID, we are treating her for the ectopic pregnancy. So on top of the surgical management for the present patient, antibiotic therapy should be added. And this, um, this image shows the inpatient management of acute pelvic inflammatory disease. So there are two regimens. Uh, the first one, regimen A, um, is the use of sofotitan, two grams IV every 12 hours, or sofoxidin, two grams IV every six hours, with an addition of doxycycline, 100 milligrams per RM, or IV every 12 hours. The second one, regimen B, would be the use of clindamycin, 900 milligrams IV every eight hours, plus gentamicin, loading dose IV or IM followed by a maintenance dose every eight hours. For the current, um, sorry, so for the current patient, we have already determined the need for hospital hospitalization. As for follow-up, so anti IV antibiotics should be continued for 24 hours after substantial improvement in the patient is seen. And then doxycycline should be completed for 14 days. So since the patient um, would undergo self-injective urine, pregnancy tests should be done after three weeks and reassessment should be done if there's still a positive pregnancy test after three weeks. So what about patient education? So patients should know that in 25% of women, they experience recurrent acute pelvic inflammatory disease. So it's important to educate them to reduce the chances of a second infection. So women should be instructed to abstain from sexual intercourse until therapy is completed or until symptoms have resolved and partners have also been treated. So we should offer barrier methods. So condoms, when used consistently and correctly, are highly effective in reducing the risk of STD and PID. There is a conflict in the use of oral contraceptive pills and PID, as um, studies showed an increased risk of C. trachomatis infection and a lower risk of symptomatic PID. So all women who received a diagnosis of acute PID should also be tested for HIV, as well as your um, gonorrhea and chlamydia using nucleic acid amplification tests. So what about treatment of sexual partners? So sexual partners should be referred for evaluation, testing, and presumptive treatment. If sexual contact with a partner happened during the 60 days preceding the patient's onset of symptoms. However, if the most recent sexual partner, um, it, if the last contact with the most recent sexual partner um, is less than 60 days, they should be evaluated and treated. So ectopic pregnancy complicated by pelvic inflammatory disease is actually not common, and there's only a few case reports that discuss the coexistence of ectopic pregnancy and pelvic inflammatory disease. And most of the discussion focused on the diagnosis and not on the management, but most of the cases were treated surgically and were given antibiotics based on the result of culture done on patients. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. I have some questions for you. So that was really a very uh, good presentation, very uh, uh, high impact, high yield presentation. Um, can you please uh, elucidate if that case that you had was it a rupture or an unruptured ectopic pregnancy? Um, it was an unruptured ectopic pregnancy, doc. No uh, fluid in the cold is that. Okay, so you, you could have mentioned that because it's important. And um, because we have uh, interns in the group, so they may not understand, I'm not sure if they know what does um, 
salpingotomy, salpingostomy, and salpingectomy. Uh, what's the difference between the three uh, forms of operation? Okay, so salpingectomy is the removal of the um, part of the fallopian tube or the, the part where the ectopic pregnancy is. So salpingostomy is um, making an opening and then removing um, removing the ectopic, the contents of the ectopic gestation from that opening. And then... Um, So what's the difference between salpingostomy and salpingotomy? Hello, Maureen? Hello, Doc. Hello, Doc. Hello, Doc. What's the difference Salping. between salpingotomy and salpingostomy? Salpingotomy, Doc, is um, after evacuation of the um, ectopic gestation from the opening that is made, we close it by primary intention, whereas salpingostomy, um, we allow secondary and we allow it to close by secondary intention. Are you sure? Can somebody else answer? Barb, in layman's term, layman's terms, in Hello, very doc. simple language, what's the difference in salpingotomy and salpingostomy? When will you do a salpingotomy and when will you do a salpingostomy? Um, doc, this is not. Hello, Hello, Hello doc. doc. Huh? Sorry, Doc. Maupo. So yeah, because I'm just on sale. Doc, this is Maupo. So by um yeah. by closing okay. it by primary intention, as I said, in salpingotomy. So that means we repair the the opening. We close it. As for salpingostomy, we left we leave it unsutured, yeah. allowing it to close by secondary intention. That's what I meant for that. So with salpingotomy, you suture, you stitch it close. While with salpingostomy, uh, you just make an incision, remove the product of conception, and then, and then you mentioned that for this case, the best uh, treatment method is salpingectomy. Uh, for me, uh, I would still give chance to salpingo salpingostomy because this is an unruptured pregnancy. So usually, it's very easy to make a decision if the ectopic is already ruptured and then it's really, there are multiple points of rupture in the fallopian tube. It's really very um, ugly. You know? you, it's, really, it's really a very abnormal looking fallopian tube. But if it's only enlarged but not yet ruptured, there's still the possibility to do a salping ghost to me. And I agree that salpingostomy, not suturing, is better than salpingotomy. So usually, there's less risk of a repeat um, ectopic pregnancy if we just uh, let the uh, disease, the fallopian tube, just heal by itself after removing the product of conception. No? So that's uh, controversial. So actually, uh, there could have been uh, also the option to do salpingostomy in this case. And then Mao, no? so you really presented uh, very well, but maybe next time you could also show pictures because uh, for the interns, maybe, I'm not sure, no, but they, they may have a hard time imagining what, the, what are the different kinds of operation. And also, for example, can you explain what is the difference between the kinds of ectopic pregnancy, if it's cornual or interstitial pregnancy. Can you um, quickly review them? Sorry, sorry, Doc, not choppy, but. 
So, can you um, explain to the interns what's the difference between a Cornwall and an interstitial pregnancy, for example? So, to understand the... the hello, Doc. To be able to understand the differences in the tubal pregnancy, we have to remember the anatomy of the tube. So remember that our fallopian tube is actually divided into the fimbrial end, the ampullary, which, which is the one that has the widest diameter, the isthmic portion, and the interstitial, that's the one that's close to the uterine cornu. So the reason why most of the ectopic gestation would occur in the ampullary area is because it, it's the one with the widest diameter. And then interstitial, um, again, as I mentioned, it's the one that's close to the cornu, but um, the uterine cornu. But if the ectopic gestation is actually in the cornual side of the uterus, that's when we say it's cornual. So my kilikili no, uterus. Okay, so maybe next time you could have shown an illustration so it's easier to uh, imagine, okay? Okay, okay um, regarding your, me you mentioned that um, women who take oral contraceptive pills are more prone to chlamydia trachomatis. So I think that's a controversial statement. So probably uh, there are some studies showing that there's an association between uh, oral contraceptive use and higher risk of chlamydia infection, but it's not causation. No? Probably there's an association, but not causation. Okay? So that's still, that's controversial, and uh, I don't think it's really uh, very significant. Okay, are there questions, Dr. Mao? Arnotate our um, ID. Residents from East Ang or from Merma from St. Luke's. Wala. Barb. Hello, Doc. Wala naman po, Doc. Ah, okay. So, bakit sinabi mo na lito ako and nabigay? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> tala ko pa ako yung tinatawag kanina. Huh? What happened? Okay. Akala, akala ko doon ako yung tinawag po kanina. Ah, okay. 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 So, are you ready for my uh, for the quiz? Um, Ma'am Gretchen, how many prizes do we have? Nandiyan pa ba si Gretchen? Anyway, our internet is spotty. Okay, so here's my first question. Please write in the chat box. What are the two most common organisms causing ectopic pregnancy? What are the two most bacterial organisms causing ectopic pregnancy? Okay, and the correct answer, actually, a lot of them answered correctly. The first one who answered correctly is Dr. Andrea Cervantes, Lamedia and Gonorrhea. Okay, congratulations, Andrea. You're from what hospital? Doc, she's our Andrea. resident in MMC. In, and She's our resident in MMC, Doc. MMC, okay. All right. Number two, second question. Uh, what antibiotic, can, what is the best antibiotic or antibiotics can we give this patient, this particular patient? Very good, Doctora Christine Pearl Ruby. You win. 
complete pa in, in uh, so remember that since the most common organisms are gonna be in the media, you have to cover for those too, no? So cyclin, doxycycline we we'll cover for the chlamydia, the triatone, we give the triatone to cover for possible gonorrhea. And metronidazole also because there are a lot of anaerobic uh, infections with PID, no? Okay. So, Dr. Christine, you're from what hospital? But the other mm -hmm. answers are correct. Okay. So, Dr. Uh, uh, Nina Rosales, you also answered correctly. This is according to the CDC treatment regimen, but you can also add uh, uh, coverage for gonorrhea, okay? But uh, good try, Dr. Rosale. So, Dr. Ruby, you're from what hospital? MMC. MMC, then. Ah, okay. MMC, Christine Pearl Rubio, intern. Okay. Last question. So, for this particular patient, how can we prevent a repeat ectopic pregnancy? For this particular patient, how do we prevent a repeat ectopic pregnancy? What is answering? Mm. No answer. Dinyo alam. Mao, ikaw na lang magano ng question. Sige, ikaw ang magbigay ng question kasi hindi ko alam. Ano bang pwede pa natin itanong? Hello, Doc. Yes, maybe you have a question. Okay, Last Doc. question um, na lang. Okay. Okay, so give one indication for hospitalizing patients with acute pelvic inflammatory disease. Pregnancy. Is that correct, Mao? Yes, Doc, when the patient is From pregnant, intern that's Jasper, positive pregnancy. But that's, very, but that's very rare. But is it an indication? Pregnant with BID. That's very rare, but it happens. Uh, yes, Doc, it's part of the indications for hospitalization. Okay. So intern Jasper wins the third question. Now from intern Christine Pearl Ruby, mm, PID, not necessarily. Uh, from intern Jeberlin can last to Bovarian abscess. Yes, that's correct. No? But the first answer was from intern Jasper, so he wins. Okay. Intern Jasper. So, Jasper, you're from what hospital? Doc, MMC po. Ah, MMC. So, all of you are from MMC. Okay, so... Uh, uh, you will be receiving Starbucks uh, prizes, care of buy. Uh, are there any other questions, clarifications? Or uh, maybe somebody wants to share their uh, experience regarding the ectopic pregnancy or readings. Maybe some of you have additional readings about ectopic pregnancy. So, so um, that's all. Uh, thank you for attending. So as a recap, 
Uh, ectopic pregnancy is very common. Remember to have a high index of suspicion. So if there's a positive pregnancy test with spotting and, and the pain, always think of ectopic pregnancy. All the women that you see in the emergency room always ask for the last menstrual period. Check if the last menstrual period was a normal flow or weak flow because she can be pregnant and she can have an ectopic pregnancy. We have had a lot of cases wherein a ectopic pregnancy was missed out in the emergency room only to find it out when the woman is already in shock. So if ever you rotate, even in other uh, departments, if she's a woman, always think of a possible pregnancy and an ectopic pregnancy, especially if she has pain and she has vaginal spotting because it's common for ectopic pregnancy to have a little bit of vaginal bleeding. Uh, as mentioned, uh, PID and ectopic pregnancy is rare. Uh, usually, women with PID do not get pregnant. They're infertile, but PID can lead eventually to ectopic pregnancy. Uh, so when you uh, treat women with PID in order to prevent infertility, remember to treat them very early. The earlier you treat them, the better the response. No? The better the chances of her getting pregnant uh, and not having an ectopic pregnancy or not having uh, uh, infertility in the future. Okay? So, Mao, do you have any other, uh, anything else to say? You want to, have, to add something more Anna to the Bada. discussion? Anna okay, Bada. thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care. And see you next week. Next week will be from East Avenue Medical Center. It will be about torch. Tama ba? It's about torch, right? Yes po, ma'am. Nandiyan so, na yung mga rotate, yung mga resident po. So, it could be more maano, malaman niyang ating uh, topic next. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye, Doc.